Um, we have with us this afternoon, slash evening, depending on where you are, uh, Peter Wade, who is a British anthropologist who specializes in issues of race and ethnicity in Latin America. He is a professor of social anthropology at the University of Manchester, who has written numerous books and articles about the social and historical meanings of race, ethnicity, and sexuality in the context of Latin America. His 2010 book, Race and Ethnicity in Latin America, has been described as an essential text for students studying the region, and it's been published in a second edition. And he's currently leading Cultures of Anti-Racism in Latin America, a project exploring how artists in Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia address racial diversity in their work and how they use their art to challenge racism. And we also have with us Monica Moreno Figuera, who is an associate professor in sociology at the University of Cambridge. And I'm really sorry I keep butchering your name. She was born and raised in Mexico. An integral part of her academic work has been her commitment to exploring different forms of engaged and engaging sociology with a deep concern for social justice. This has taken her to develop links and projects that aim to make racism public as a strategy for its elimination. In the summer of 2011, she co-founded the collective Coperera, Copera, excuse me, um, and the collective has been developing a series of initiatives to visibilize racism in its multiple forms in the country. So they're going to give us a joint presentation today. I should have introduced myself, I apologise. My name is Kesava John, I'm a lecturer in Caribbean history here at the Institute of the Americas at UCL. Um, I suppose without any further ado, I'll let Peter and Monica present. Um, if you do have questions, you can put them in the chat, um, and, but we'll take the questions at the end as well. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, Okay. Okay, so can you all see it okay? Yeah. Okay, so we've called our presentation Alternative Grammars of Anti-Racism. Um, sorry, I should say in Latin America, first mistake. And uh, basically what we want to do here is present to you the results of a project called Latin American Anti-Racism in a Post-Racial Age, La Pora, which ran from 17 to 1920. And I just want to show you all the names here of the people and the four teams. It's a comparative project looking at anti-racist action in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and Mexico. And what we're presenting here today is the result of the collaboration, the discussions, the research of all of these people. And I also want you to see them so that you know most of them and they are all part, um, it's very important for us to give testimony to their work and to their presence in what we're presenting to you here. So just to tell you a little bit about the project, the project looked at these four countries trying to have more relational than comparative, but there are still some elements that where we try to put these four countries and map out the different anti-racist initiatives and actions and discussions and discourses, bringing to be specifically looking at social movements, um, activists, governments, governmental action, uh, some local legal cases. So we were trying to map out what is this, um, how are, how is it working now that what we've called the turn to anti-racism, where there is more and more action and what kind of action is that? We wanted to look at particularly the work coming from indigenous peoples and black people, but also there are some mestizo initiatives or some you know, broader initiatives. We look at these four research areas, as I said, and it's based in nine months of field work where the researchers, um, the postgrad, the postdoctoral researchers dedicated a very, uh, you know, this amount of time to really look deeply into these, um, these cases. So what we're going to do now is talk about some perspectives, some of the cases and some, a key perspective in our work that what we call the alternative grammar. So I'm going to pass on to Peter now. Okay, thank you, Monica. Um, so yeah, we were looking uh, at a particular context. I suppose that one can, you know, if one wants to put a date on it, one might start around 2010, but with some 
roots going back to the Durban Conference of uh, 2001, uh, the Durban anti -race, World Conference on Anti-Racism, uh, which we call the turn to anti-racism, which is gradually gaining, gaining some ground in Latin America. And this happens in the context of um, a kind of disenchantment with the reforms that began in the very in the late 80s and took place throughout the, the 90s in Latin America towards uh, a kind of official or state multiculturalism. So I don't know how much people know about Latin America and, and so on, but it, around from about 1988, a series of reforms, um, constitutional reforms, political reforms, legal reforms, um, recognized the rights of indigenous and to a lesser extent Afro-descendant peoples in most uh, Latin American countries and recognized the nation as being um, pluricultural or multicultural or multi-ethnic, um, uh, it's on different terms were used in different places. And a lot of rights were handed out, um, mostly land rights, uh, at least in you know, on paper sort of thing. In practice, things became a lot more difficult and often violent, um, but also rights to multicultural education, rights to sit on certain kinds of government committees and so forth. Um, but by the sort of beginnings of the 2000s, there was a widespread disenchantment with that whole process as people began to see its limitations and began to see how governments were using multiculturalism in a kind of cooptative and tokenistic fashion, while at the same time, um, business as usual was going on in terms of uh, land grabs and development uh, projects and so on, and uh, increasing violence, especially towards uh, indigenous people. Um, so in that context, people began to, or black and indigenous organizations began to pay increasing attention to racism, to racial inequality, which had not really been a major feature of the kind of recognition politics of, of the multicultural term. And then, of course, governments also started to pay uh, more attention to uh, anti-racism and to try to co-opt these, um, these uh, initiatives and so on, and to begin to talk more and more about uh, racism and anti-racism themselves. So uh, in that context, we found that there were, in our research, we found very diverse ways of talking and sometimes not talking about both racism and anti-racism. So there are two dimensions here. One was whether people were explicitly using the language of racism and <coughs> identifying their actions as anti-racist and using that kind of language, or whether they were talking about injustice and inequality uh, in a more and sort of implying racism in, in a more indirect way. So that was one dimension. Another was the way in which they talked about racism. Did they think about racism and talk about racism as a kind of series of behavioral issues of, uh, of the bad attitudes of individual people or um, you know, bad behaviors by institutional <coughs> um, uh, gatekeepers and so on? Or did they talk about racism as being a systemic um, whole, a set of embedded institutionalized practices uh, that ran right through the society? <coughs> and so, <coughs> excuse me, we were interested in thinking about what, what are the implications of these different ways of thinking and talking about racism for anti-racist strategies. Uh, next slide, please, Monica. So the, re <coughs> the, the significance of this is that they, these questions relate to you know, much bigger questions about how best to tackle racialized inequality and injustice. And here we can identify two sort of broad approaches, which are, if you like, uh, poles on a, a opposite uh, ends of a continuum. One is to see race and racism as kind of incidental to the basic uh, structures of capitalism and liberalism, that they are anachron it's a, you know, racism is a kind of anachronism that can be a wrinkle that can be ironed out uh, by perfecting the operations of, of capitalism and liberal democracy and so forth. Um, the other sort of opposed view is to see race and racism as actually deeply constitutive of capitalism, liberalism, and broadly speaking, modernity. And this is a kind of view that can be uh, traced in a lot of many different theoretical currents, post-colonialism, critical race theory, coloniality, decoloniality, et cetera, Afro-pessimism, some uh, currents of black radicalism, so on. 
So clearly, if, if race and racism are, con are seen as constitutive of capitalism, liberalism, modernity, then you know, getting rid of racism is going to be a much more challenging, is going to require much deeper and more radical changes to the structures of society than if you just see it as a kind of wrinkle or an anachronism that can be ironed out. Now, in both of these approaches, it seems that racism is something that you have to start by naming and identifying and calling it out. So one of the things that we were interested in is, well, you know, is that, should we take that for granted? Do we necessarily have to always explicitly name racism? Or maybe there's uh, another way of, of, of approaching these things. And a second issue was that if we see racism as constitutive, which we, we do, that's the kind of the view we, we take, we agree with that view in our project. Um, but if we see it as constitutive, the, the, the problem there is that it really sets the bar for effective action very high. So if, you, if your anti-racist strategy doesn't involve challenging the sort of underlying structures of liberalism and capitalism and so on, then the danger is you say, oh, well, it's not, you know, it's not worth doing. And in fact, you might even see it as counterproductive because it doesn't challenge those deep, uh, deep structures. So that tends to create a kind of super critical um, perspective that always says, yes, Yes, you're, what you're doing and your strategy and tactic is, is okay, but it doesn't go far enough because it doesn't uh, challenge the basic structures of capitalism and so on. So we were interested in trying to work with uh, you know, using Caroline, Caroline Pedral's idea of an imbrication of the revolutionary in the routine. That is to say that you can somehow bring together these kind of more routine, everyday reformist measures while at the same time, having a kind of re revolutionary or radical uh, horizon or long-term view about things. And, you know, we came to these conclusions by, because when we looked at what was going on in Latin America, uh, the, the, uh, we found a huge diversity of people doing all kinds of different things that were challenging and uh, challenging racial inequality, challenging uh, the invisibilization of black and indigenous people, um, and so on, a very a, a big diversity. So we were tempted then to take a kind of inclusive view, not to say, well, let's try and see which what, which of these strat of these strategies, which of these organisations, you know, is taking the most radical view and is doing the you know what we consider to be the best the best practice kind of thing. You know, we were thinking, okay, well, everybody's working really hard here. They're always they're all interested in challenging racism in different ways. So let's try and be inclusive without, therefore saying, well, anything goes, that anything is, you know, is, is as effective as something else. So we, somehow we needed to maintain a radical vision, a radical kind of horizon that allowed us to suggest to people uh, ways in which they could adapt to what they were already doing to make it perhaps more effective or have more impact. And we were also interested then in considering whether some of the organizations which took an indirect appro approach to racism didn't necessarily name and put racism front and center perhaps also had something to uh, to contribute next slide please so some of the organizations we looked at did indeed were very explicit about racism so here's an example from colombia of an organization called chao racismo which was founded by a, a, a kind of middle class black lawyer and as you can tell from the name, they put racism right at the front and center of their agenda, of their whole strategy. Um, and in, to some extent, they had a kind of structural view of what racism was and how one might challenge it, because they wanted to challenge the equation of negro, black, with pobre, poor. So they saw you know, that was the kind of fundamental thing that needed addressing. And they did that in certain, in, in, I mean, a couple of things they did was to address employment issues <clears throat> via a kind of certification program that they uh, developed, where they would certify or give, you know, a, cer a certificate to certain businesses who had inclusive employment policies, or inclusive of Afro-descendant people, uh, and they would certify them as being, you know, good employers. And they also, um, uh, had kind of youth directed initiatives whereby they would organize kind of events, parties really, uh, for young people in 
cities like Buenaventura and Cali, which uh, where, where experienced very high levels of violence, of youth violence and so on. Um, so to give you know, young people a kind of alternative outlets to uh, hanging out on the street and you know, getting involved in violence and, and drug dealing and so on. So in some ways, you know, one could say they, these were sort of trying to address some of, some of the structural issues perhaps, but the overall dynamic of the organization was in the end, a kind of middle-class entrism. You know, they tried to, uh, to challenge the black equals poor equation by creating a, a, a black middle class. And a black middle class that was, uh, in the words of the, the director, fashion, sexy, ichi, ichik, that is to say fashionable, sexy and chic. So that was the idea was to sort of create this sort of black middle class that was good looking, that was fashionable, that, that non-black middle class people would be, would admire and want to emulate and, uh, and consume uh, basically through uh, practices of consumption. And you can see that going on with the the Charracismo t-shirt, this is a kind of beauty pageant with, you know, white and light skinned mestiza women, uh, you know, being um, uh, encouraged to wear the Charracismo t-shirt and say, yes, we're, you know, we're behind anti-racism as well. So, you know, there the, 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 the were limits, significant limits to their, the radical, the radicality of the vision here, because they were basically accepting the structures of capitalism, the value of entrepreneurialism and so forth. Um, but that didn't mean to say that what they were doing wasn't valuable. You know, we couldn't just say, oh, well, you know, they're not addressing structural racism in a, in a, in a, in a radical enough way. Therefore, what they're doing is uh, a no good or even sort of counterproductive. You know, they were getting racism onto the into the public stage and they were talking about it and getting it spoken about. So that was a, a valuable thing, um, which was, you know, uh, had to, in our view should be recognized. Uh, next, thank you. Yes. But we were also interested and the major and I suppose actually the majority of the of the organizations we looked at didn't actually foreground racism in a kind of explicit and direct way. That is to say they didn't make it front and center of their agenda in the way that child racismo did. And so we coined the idea collectively as a, as a team, we coined the, the, the concept of alternative grammars of anti-racism to sort of capture this, this uh, way of uh, addressing racism in, a, in an indirect fashion. And just as a parenthesis, um, you know, wh why do we choose the word grammar here? Uh, we've, we've been asked about this in the past. You know, we could have said alternative discourses of anti-racism, we could have said alternative practices of anti-racism, but we were specifically interested in the, the kind of the use of the word and the way that people talked about racism. Um, and also, you know, we were seeing we're seeing grammar here, not just as a sort of matter of, of syntax and so on, but as a way as a way of constructing statements that make sense about race and racism in a, in a particular social context. So that's just a little parenthesis about the word grammar. So one sort of very, very significant example of this alternative grammar of anti-racism is what, what I've called a racially aware class consciousness, which we found, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll give examples of this in a minute. Um, this basically, this is a kind of a consciousness of social inequality and social injustice that is inflected uh, with some kind of awareness that your your status as a black or indigenous person or a brown skinned person a brown you know a, a brown skinned mestizo person somehow that has got something to do with the your class situation your situation of disadvantage of oppression and so forth even though you don't necessarily talk about that first and foremost when you're trying to challenge these in inequalities so this is important because in mestizo societies like those of Latin America, where you know large uh, proportions of the population don't identify either necessarily straightforwardly as white or straightforwardly as black or indigenous, but are something in the middle, kind of brown or mestizo, um, the the salience of this clearly defined racial identities for people's sense of belonging, for people's sense of uh, of identification. You know that salience is quite is relatively low in many contexts not all contexts but many contexts um and so you know it's quite difficult for racial identities to kind of get a grip to gain, gain some traction and sometimes that's seen as exactly the problem you know the whole point of anti-racism in latin america from the point of view of many black and indigenous organizations is to make people identify explicitly and publicly as black or indigenous um 
But these societies are also ones in which race and class very much tend to coincide, not completely, but uh, statistically, the lighter your skin, the more chance you have of being you know, better educated in the middle class or upper class. Conversely, the darker your skin the, or the more indigenous or African looking you are, um, the more likely it is that you will be in the lower echelons of society. So somehow race and class go together in ways that are, is particularly Latin American and is very different from, um, let's say, North America or, uh, or, or Europe. Uh, next slide, please, Monica. Okay, so very briefly, because this is something we're going to come back to at the end. What are the strengths and the possible strengths and risks of alternative grammars of anti-racism? The strengths are that it does precisely address that intersection between race and class. So it brings a structural focus and it almost automatically to, um, to your approach, to, uh, to your understandings of, of, of race and, uh, and racism in society. Um, it's also potentially inclusive. So, for example, we found that when some of the indigenous organizations we worked with, they didn't really identify with the language of race and racism and anti-racism. You know, they were talking about land primarily, uh, but also a language, a rights to language and, um, and so forth. So, you know, for them, racism, you know, maybe they would talk about it a bit, but not that much. But so this kind of alternative grammars approach includes that, that kind of um, reluctance, if you like, to talk about, about racism. But at the same time, racism doesn't just vanish off the map, because in Latin America, one of the classic techniques of middle class and elite people who want to deny the role of race and the existence of racism is to say, oh, no, it's nothing to do with race. It's all to do with class. So, you know, we, we want to try and avoid falling into that trap. Um, but the good thing about these alternative grammars of anti-racism is that racism doesn't disappear, as we'll see. But there are certain risks, which is that these alternative grammars, if people aren't emphasizing, aren't you know, putting racism front and center of their agendas, there's a possibility, you know, there's a risk that they will underestimate the very integral role that race, race and racism play in generating um, systems of inequality, the way in which they naturalize uh, that, those inequalities and make them seem inevitable, and the way in which they dehumanize indigenous and, and black people uh, and make their lives seem naturally and inevitably less valuable than that of uh, lighter skinned and, and whiter people. Okay, so now we're going to give three cases from Brazil, Mexico and Ecuador to sort of illustrate this and we'll look at how explicitly racism is named and not named and how they talk about racism uh, and thinking about what possibilities might be might be opened up by radical perspectives on racism in each case. Uh, and we'll see how uh, these organizations are really concerned with struggles for safety in the first case, political power in the second case and land uh, in the third case and how these struggles can have anti-racist dimensions. So I'll pass over to Monica now. Thank you, Pete. Okay, so I want to first, uh, we want to first present to you the case of the Rede de Comunidades de Movimentos Contra Violencia. Uh, it's a Rio de Janeiro-based movement in Brazil. It started um, in about 2003 as a reaction to a series of four police massacres in the city's favelas. It has, or at the time of the research, it had 60 members, most of whom were favela dwelling mothers who self-identify as negra, as black. Of these, about 20 are very active in the groups that means regularly attend meetings and activities, street protests, demonstrations, they register like official complaints, they attend uh, court cases. Um, and they are also very clearly allies and supporters that also join the organization like students, researchers, other activists. And their main government interlocutor, the one that they are constantly, you know, uh, addressing about the cases that they, they look at or they, they defend, is the public ombudsman or defender of the state of Rio. Um, the Red, uh, the network uh, of mothers, denounces genocide and challenges mainstream drug war narratives, mass incarceration practices, and particularly they're interested in the criminalization of protests. 
So they denounce racism in the justice system, drawing on data that shows that 71% of homicides in Brazil are of black people, that there have been a 40% rise in black deaths, not just police killings, in the decade to 2014, and that controlling for age, sex, education, and place of residence, black people in Rio City are 24% more often victims of homicide than whites. And that in Sao Paulo state in 2011, blacks were three times more likely than whites to be killed by police. So this is part of what they are. I mean, you can see them here that they're connected to Amnesty International. You know, they are, their struggle is a struggle for dignity, it's a struggle for their young sons, uh, siblings, um, and that's what they get organized uh, for. So the, the, net, the network, um, we ask them in this, in this case, looking at this case, how central is racism in their actions, their discourse, their agenda? And what we, we saw, first of all, is that the women in the network tend to identify themselves as black, as negra, but this was rarely a matter of open discussion or affirmation. This was not something that people would be you know, pondering about or bring it to the fore very uh, consciously or constantly. The mother's protest against police um, violence frequently refers simply to the favelas and young male favela dwellers as the victims. So that also, that didn't necessarily put um, um, blackness to the forefront, but it was clear that black people, that that, that most of the murder sons were black, although this was not insistently made explicit by the mothers and was usually more adduced alongside being a favelado or being poor as an intersectional whole, you know, like referring this, con they refer um, connecting, connecting being black with being living in the favelas and being poor. Uh, the calls and claims that were made for justice and against state extermination by the state were like clearly um, at the forefront. And what they would be more putting more forward was their claim for their status as mothers, as black, as indigenous, you know, as workers, as poor. They will bring all this wholeness or this kind of um, almost a more complete picture of their situation. And, and racism was not explicitly named in their networks, banners and posters. With this all, you know, we, they all recognize that police violence in favelas has an impact that crosses racial difference and indeed includes significant number of white victims as well. So you see this, um, this phrase that they would say, you know, in their claims, you know, we are black mothers, we are mothers, we are indigenous mothers working mothers, poor mothers, slum mothers, peripheral mothers, were, worried mo were warrior mothers. So their position as mothers was something that was more clearly put forward. So at the same time, however, even though racism was not at the forefront of blackness, the underlying racialized character of the killings and the protesters was ever present and among the mothers, the discourse of lethal racism was easily and frequently deployed in various ways. You know, so for example, data on violence um, often was often collected according to age, sex, and color, opposing black to white rather than class. The correlations between class, neighborhood, and violence are complex, and it's not easy to find clear and simple data. Thus, the availability of data, which obeys to state's orientation towards racism, tends to highlight racial factors. The word genocide that they use very frequently, well, that they use occasionally in the banners displayed in public demonstrations, these words evoke the idea of threat to a particular, very specific national, and ethnic, racial, and religious group, which is how the UN defines genocide. When we see the photos of the victims, we see that they are all young black men, albeit of varied, even if they are of varied skin tones. And that form a central part of the visual aspect of these demonstrations and made the racialized character of the killings tacitly but abundantly clear, as did the bodies of the mothers themselves. 
So this was a strategy, um, they, they use a strategic, um, they use their bodies in strategic ways and they use images in strategic ways to highlight the suffering and the emotion that was being carried around uh, with this act, with these um, killings. And they wanted to question the spectacle and voyeurism around damaged bodies, you know, the bodies of their sons and themselves. And, and it was clear to see that the bodies were clearly racializing disadvantage. They were negatively racialized bodies. In public speeches, mothers occasionally reiterated the racial bias, bias of the violence and talk of favelas as black territories, which is also quite important. So in interviews, one mother said, my children died at the hands of a racist police force because they were in a racialized territory you know, the favela particularly. Another said, here in Brazil, you do not need to be guilty or involved in crime to be killed. Just be black, poor, and leave in the favela to be in the sights of the police. You know, although a second later, she also said only poor and from the favela, reinforcing this absent present quality of racialized identifications. So what we can see from this example is that racism came in and into and out of focus. Although in this case, it was more in focus, you know, more often than in the next two cases that we're gonna see. Um, this implies then that there is an awareness of structural racism. They understand that their situation has to do, what they are going through has to do with their specific position and how and their, and their bodies and who they are and where they live and their, their social economic position. But not necessarily they use a consistent strategic use of explicit talk on race and racism. So there is something important here of how racism is present, but in a more diffuse way. There was also an ambiguity about the intersection of race and class, not coinciding, coinciding fully, but overlapping. And of course, the presence of gender and mobilizing gender here as, be, as mothers, which we explore more broadly in another paper. But here, it's just important to mention that here there is also an, the additional mobilization of motherhood to reinforce their claim. So, racism is not the main or the only the only um, idea that it's being negotiated or put forward. Okay, Pete now. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the second example is from Mexico, the Congreso Nacional Indígena, which is a, uh, a large kind of national indigenous organization in Mexico. And here we're looking at an alternative, if the previous alternative grammar was about safety, security, life, etc., this alternative grammar focuses on political power. And uh, the particular example is the Consejo de Gobierno Indígena, which was uh, kind of formed as a subgroup of the Congreso Nacional Indígena in 2017 in the context of uh, upcoming presidential elections. And it was formed in order to try and get an indigenous candidate onto the slate uh, of presidential candidates. And they chose um, this woman, Maria de, de Jesus Patricio, otherwise commonly known as Marichui, her nickname, who was a, um, a, a, Nahuatl, a Nahuatl indigenous healer um, of, um, uh, of, of some repute in, in her community and, and nationally. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so the, the Congreso Nacional Indígena is a, you know, an avowedly radical anti-capitalist organization. It was born out of links with the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional, so a left-wing Marxist organization from the 1990s that organized a kind of you know, rebellion, an armed rebellion in, uh, in the south of Mexico. That's where their roots lie, and they're very clear about that. And uh, accordingly, they speak on behalf of uh, what they call Los de Abajo, the, the people from below. And here are some quotes from uh, their, their website. Um, we hear the pain of people like us, of all colors, who are what they call El México de Abajo. Escuchamos el dolor de todos los colores que somos El México de Abajo. Um, they also say, it is not only the racism of the political structure that did not allow our proposal to appear on the electoral, electoral ballot, 
because if those who oppose capitalism's destruction of the world shared amongst them slanted blue and red eyes, public policy and supposed democracy would be made to exclude them, which is a slightly convoluted way of saying, you know, it doesn't matter what color you are, if you're poor, uh, you know, capitalism or, and uh, you know, the, the government will, will screw you over anyway, or will exclude you anyway. So um, along with that kind of overriding emphasis on class, Marxist derived emphasis on class, we found there was only occasional reference to racism in their ex explicit public discourse. So they talk about, occasionally they talk about in their, in their statements and so forth, they talk about conditions of marginality, racism and discrimination. So racism is mentioned alongside other things there. The word racismo appears only nine times in four years of, the, of blog posts and <clears throat> um, news notifications and so on on their websites. Nevertheless, it's clear that there's a very strong sense of indigeneity operating in everything they do. So there's constant reference to los pueblos indígenas as being the kind of uh, um, the, the, the object of their of their discourse of their organization uh, and what they're everything that they're, that, that they're about. They say they're seeking autonomy um, based on the space of the indios. They're using the colonial term indios that we are el espacio de los indios que somos. So it's very clear that there's a strong sense of racialized subalternity, which is below the surface mostly, but it's nevertheless there, it's always there. And that was made very clear when um, there was a, the reaction to Marie Chui's electoral campaign in 2017, um, uh, was a, a, a significant racist back, backlash on social media, specifically Twitter, which is the social media of choice for, for hate speech, as we know. So these are a couple of examples. Uh, of uh, posts that were made. I would vote for Marie Chui. You can see she has experience in cleaning Mexico. So the idea is that, you know, she's a, an indigenous woman, therefore she's a, she's a maid, therefore she has ex experience in cleaning. And, you know, cleaning Mexico, that is getting rid of uh, corruption, etc. That Marie Chui looks like the woman who does the cleaning in my house. So constant reference to uh, this intersection between race, class, gender, and domestic service, which is, you know, so, um, a kind of neuralgic point that resonates right across Latin America, not just um, in Mexico. So that made it clear that racism was very much part of the story. So while Los de Abajo, that whole discourse about Los de Abajo backgrounds that evident racism, um, we can see that there's nevertheless a kind of racially aware, and in this case, a very gendered class consciousness, which is also, in this case, a class consciousness that can build coalitions. So you wouldn't have to be an indigenous woman to feel angry at those um, tweet at those tweets. You know, you could be a dark-skinned uh, mestiza, or you could be uh, a, a black, or you know, any sort of lowest class dark-skinned woman who perhaps has, you know, works as a domestic servant or something would feel, could feel, and identify uh, with anger at those comments about her without necessarily being indigenous. So that implies a kind of very structural perspective on the whole racialized power structure of Mexico, that uh, you know everybody, a, a diversity of people, uh, indigenous, black, dark skinned, and so on, are in the same kind of position. So this is an example of a kind of uneven use of the explicit discourse of racism, but with an underlying and very strong underlying awareness of structural racism, stroke classism. Back to Monica. So the third and final example is of Wimbi, an Ecuadorian community, um, and we call it here the alternative grammar of environment and land because basically we found this community when they were having a struggle with a palm oil multinational giant. So Wimby is in Ecuador in the Pacific coastal region and has been ancestrally occupied by black and some indigenous communities at the region. Uh, for centuries, but increasingly in the last few decades, the area has been subject to exploitation by outside interests, mainly white, mestizo, national and international. 
mainly for natural resources, for minerals and timber, but also agro-industrial production, palm oil plantations and shrimp, shrimp farms. Members of local communities are often involved in these enterprises as workers in different modalities. And they may also be small entrepreneurs linked to their incoming businesses. They may sell land or rights to resources or concede them in exchange of other benefits like a road construction or um, another things. However, conflicts emerge over land grabs and over environmental destruction, which is basically has to do with the use and contamination of water and the destruction of the forest. Resistance by local communities is in this way principally about land and the environment, because for these local activists, um, they, what they do is use legal instruments, including rights to the titling of ancestral lands accorded to them as Afro-Ecuadorian peoples. They mobilize the Ecuador's Defensoria del Pueblo, like the Ombudsman, and they use alliances with the Catholic uh, Church Pastoral Social, like the Social Ministry, and environmentalist NGOs to work together, you know, to resist or, well, or to get organized about this. So in all these, uh, in their struggle, racism and anti-racism are not often mentioned explicitly by locals, uh, by allies, or even by some social science analysts of the situation. And when the interview in the interviewees mention it during our field work, when they mention the word racism or anti-racism, it's often in context of direct discrimination rather than structural processes. Yet there is some underlying awareness among locals of structural issues linked to their racialized condition. Although in our interviews, it is mostly among a certain educated and activist group. So it's not a standard, you know, that thing that crosses all the people in the community. So things like this, you know, they do this to us because we're black. It seems they want to eliminate us just because it's only with black it's only with black and indigenous peoples that you can see such abuse of our rights. The palm oil company says we've won against really important people. Are we going to lose to these blackies or negritos? No. It has been said that the state doesn't care about the lives of black people in the area. And, and, and this a local priest that said in the class of poor people where there are blacks, whites and mestizos, the most fucked up of all is the black. There is a racial problem. I believe it's a racial struggle, not a class struggle. So um, the question here of blackness then, um, and thus of implicitly of racism, also arises in other ways. Uh, on the one hand, we can see that land can be claimed as ancestral lands of, uh, of Afro-Ecuadorian communities. Even if this relates to multiculturalism, it still foregrounds a category for which racialized difference could be made evident, and indeed is made evident by some of them. Secondly, outsiders often portray the region as a whole as inferior, as underdeveloped, uncivilized because of its black and indigenous population. Therefore, there is an underlying racialization linked to the historical geography and moral topography of the country, which creates and sustains on the one hand a structural link between underdevelopment and blackness and indigeneity, and on the other hand, constructs an image of the region as a place open to exploitation by any means necessary in order to make a profit. Thus the struggles for land and against environmental destruction are also implicitly anti-racist struggles, not just from our point of view as analysts, making an argument about the operation of structural racism, but from the point of view of some of the local people too. What are the implications of this? As in previous, the previous uh, two cases, um, we wonder how do we locate here their use or not use of race and the discourse of race and racism. On the one hand, pursuing land and well-being uh, as a local or regional group may be productive in gaining ground in a material sense. In a context of mestizaje or in other contexts of the post-racial denial and delegitimation of racism, it can be an effective tactic for maximizing the legitimacy of claims and struggles in the eyes of others. You know, uh, for example, it may avoid the threat of delegitimation that a more clearly racial demand may attract. On the other hand, 
it leaves implicit a key factor in the suit of mechanisms that reproduce disadvantage and block struggle. So like the Red and the Consejo Nacional Indígena, racism came into and out of focus, although in this case, it was rather less in focus than in both the Red and, um, and the Congreso Nacional Indígena. Uh, as the, in those cases, there was ambiguity about the intersection of race and class, an appreciation of fact that they did not coincide completely, but they did overlap a great deal. For Wimby, we see a lesser awareness of structural racism alongside a good deal of clarity about the unequal exploitation of land and environmental consequences, a clarity that is nevertheless tinged with a sense that the racialized position of the area of the area's inhabitants is somehow involved in this inequality. That is, you know, they are racially, there is a racially aware class consciousness. T. Okay, so um, we've traced that there's been a, a recent focus on uh, racism, more perhaps than there has been in the past. And uh, from the point of view of black and sort of a lesser extent indigenous organizations, anti-racist organizations, this is often seen as a useful thing, as a good thing, because in a mestizo society, one of the kind of key characteristics of the, the ideology around being mestizo society is that you know, racism isn't a problem, uh, race is not a salient uh, you know, form of identification or form of inequality in these societies and so it's often seen as useful to focus on racism call it out focus on racialized identities in very clear ways make people identify clearly as you know as indigenous or black and so on um, so that seems as, 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 a, as a useful thing as a, a, a good turn but um, it can lead to some limited outcomes so for example one of the key ways in which the state has dealt with anti-racism in that whole turn to anti-racism is through legislation by creating anti-discrimination legislation um, which as we know is you know is useful is certainly necessary but can be quite limited because for various reasons one is that often the, the, it's, the legal process sets the bar very high for proving uh, legal uh, for, for proving discrimination for proving racism therefore the number of convictions that actually occur for hate, racial hate crime or racial discrimination is, is quite low. Um, and often racial discrimination gets kind of lumped in alongside disabilism, uh, sexism, um, other kinds of discriminations, which tend to detract from the specificity of racism and its roots in, 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 you know, in coloniality and so on. So, you know, focusing on racism, calling it out, naming it and so on uh, is useful uh, and it can lead to limited outcomes, but it's nevertheless useful. But we can also address these kind of class race intersections that we've been looking at, which leads us to a structural perspective and automatically kind of brings this structural perspective in. So these alternative grammars, the, what's interesting about them is the way they address these basic structures of, um, of inequality <coughs> without, without completely ignoring race and um, we argue I think that this can provide a foothold for anti-racism in a mestizo society. Now one question that has, that has been raised you know in the past uh, in relation to, to that argument is you know isn't this just pandering to mestizo fragility which is a kind of version of you know white fragility and the answer to that is no because although it is a, a, a a class consciousness, it's a racially aware class consciousness, which means that race doesn't disappear off the, uh, off the agenda. It just takes um, a slightly indirect role. So um, what we found is that there are risks here of underestimating the importance of the integral role racism and racialized inequality plays in structuring hierarchy and inequality as a whole. So we see that Wimby locals are unevenly aware of the historical intersections of race and class via colonialism, which have over the centuries produced that durable and often inflexible layers and accumulations that constitute today's social structures. 
even the people of the Congreso Nacional Indígena who often deploy a discourse that is explicitly aware of these things, often also put them in a Marxist frame that reduces racism to an ideological tool at the service of capitalism, rather than seeing it as, a hist as historically constitutive of capitalism and liberal political orders. So what we argue here is that it's worth exploiting the current turn to anti-racism in Latin America and working with a political radical horizon in view, but also highlighting how just how much racism has been and still is integral to the fabric of the glass system that is highlighting the, the racialized dimensions of inequality and of struggles in the systematic character of racialized disadvantage. So we argue that this is worthwhile in itself and working in this way, moreover, other effects might be entailed like black and indigenous alliances, emphasizing racism is often seen as divisive and causing separations between black people who tend to be more easily um, to think in terms of racism and indigenous people who often tend to avoid the concept. So, but grasping racism in its structural dimension and its intersections with class can provide a common platform on which to mobilize around land, resources, power, security, well-being, um, et cetera, environmental concerns, and of course, as well, we can think of bringing here um, the gender element to this discussion. The other advantage is that we can see mestizos as allies. The same approach can also give mestizos a way of seeing how they are implicated in the system as people who are also oppressed by the intersections of race and class, even if they are not indigenous or black, and simultaneously as people who might sometimes benefit from and sometimes reproduce those intersections. So what we think then is to talk in terms of racism and racial disadvantage as structural issues, not just as individual acts of stigmatization and discrimination can actually help wider claims of social justice and, and, and change, right? So I think, yeah, we're, I'm gonna, I think that this is quite important because it then risks, um, underestimating the importance of the role racism play, you know, if we, if we do not kind of consider this possibility of the alternative, of the alternative grammars that we're proposing. Well, so then what we think is that then doing this is worth exploiting this turn, as I mentioned a little bit before, but also can be very useful to highlight these less visible racialized dimensions of inequality and of struggles to see that from the one hand there is um, there is a high to, that is important to highlight systemic intersections of racial gender and class inequality and disadvantage and by doing this we can bring forward an agenda of change of social transformation that is not just trying to focus on you know that is an issue about class that is an issue about gender race but it is an issue about a good life and how peoples and different um, communities in Latin America and other parts of the world are trying to move all of these issues together because they need to be together. They cannot be seen as separate. And I think these terms, that's what we are arguing that this idea of the alternative grammars can help us see methodologically and also um, you know, uh, raise research questions that can have a broader appeal um, a more accurate picture and paint a more accurate picture. And we will end with that. Before we end, I'm going to end this sh show. And I want to just show you um, the book. Can you see the screen? So the book is coming out in March, we hope. Um, and the book will contain our, you know, our overall cases the overall work is very very interesting it's beautiful I, I have to make the announcement look at that cover it's great and we hope that you will look at it and we'll meet again to introduce the book and all the other aspects of our argument but this I, th I think gives you very much um, a sense and a flavor of what we want to say where we're coming from okay stop and end thank you well, 
I can only thank you both for Fats for sharing what was absolutely fascinating. A really, really thought-provoking paper for myself. And I've seen a couple of hands and questions, so I can see that you've also provoked questions for other people. Um, yes, I'm still reflecting on lots of different things, but I will let other people take the, the right stage. Uh, I think I saw Ange had her hand up. Ange, would you like to turn your camera on and ask a question? I don't have a surname, I just have Ange, but if not, uh, I see Nick also has his hand up, so I'll let him ask his question. Thank you both. Um, that was a, a, a really um, fascinating um, set, of, set of remarks and, and speaks to a really impressive project and the, the comparative dimension I found to be to be really, really interesting and eye-opening, as well as the, the way that you were bringing that theory of the imbrication of the, re the revolutionary and the routine uh, to, to bear on the case studies, which I found, I found really, really eye-opening. I guess my question is quite, quite basic, but I'd be interested to hear you say more about it if you think it's relevant, is to know where backlash to anti-racism fits within these um, these grammars of anti-racism, these anti-racist movements that you're that you're talking about, because it strikes me, coming at this from the context of a of a, a North American, as someone who focuses on the U.S., that that is such a such a, a, a significant part of the history and the present moment of anti-racist anti-racist activism and anti-racism in the United States is is fundamental backlash, and I and I know that that's the case in Latin America as well. So I I wondered if 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 in the theories of anti-racism that you saw being developed, both explicitly and implicitly whether there was a, a sense of how to respond not only to the structures of white supremacy that are being encountered, but also the, the kind of inevitable backlashes to anti-racism that, that emerge. Well, I think um, I'll start and maybe Pete can say more. I think precisely what we see that why some organizations decide to use or not to forefront the language of racism has to do with how it has worked out previously, what experiences they had. And it's interesting because we are in a situation where in Latin America, many people's organizations are just almost uh, embracing the, the discourse of racism and understanding racism. And, you know, we, we've been for years trying to make, to, to see how racism is a thing, to declare it, that it exists. And at the same time, we can see how we need to position against this backlash that with its specificities for Latin America, it's also happening. And I think one of the things we detected is precisely how this turn to anti-racism has the potential, and we see it happening already, of deflecting, minimizing, the de de legitimizing the discourses by the ways in which anti-racism is used. So some anti-racist struggle or some anti-racist initiatives actually dismantle or try to dismantle, right? So uh, the, the same effort. So we have to be very careful of how that works. So I see it happening in those various moments, I think. No, Pete, you might have something else to say. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree with that. I mean, you know, one of the things that we are, I mean, the backlash certainly does occur, as you saw with the, the comments on uh, Marie Chui's, uh, you know, presidential candidacy. Um, and, you know, that's just the kind of tip of an iceberg of, uh, of the kinds of backlashes that are occurring <coughs> all over Latin America with the, you know, after the pink tide, there was a kind of swing to the right with people like uh, Bolsonaro being the, the most obvious example. And with, you know, very strong critiques of, you know, indigenous land rights and special provision for indigenous peoples and, and so on, um, which is, you know, fundamentally a kind of backlash against an anti-racism, um, although it's phrased, not always phrased in terms of race, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, so, you know, this is why we think it's important to try and mobilize these movements that are uh, that intersect race and class in ways that because everybody will uh, agree that you know class inequality is unfair or you know potentially unfair uh, uh, there might be meritocratic legitimations of uh, of inequality and so on you know there's much more consensus around the idea that, in, that class inequality is something that needs to be addressed whereas racial inequality often you know with the backlash tends to 
identify that as somehow being unfair, as being counterproductive, as introducing division where division didn't exist. These are the kind of typical arguments that are, uh, are, are a part of that backlash. So, you know, combining race and class in this way and gender, you know, is possibly one way of trying to avoid the, that, the, the specificities of that backlash. That's, I think, what I, what I would say. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I was quite struck by the, the, the way that you described the connection of race and class, because we see absolutely identical, I would say, but perhaps that's overstating it, being over deterministic, but very, very, very similar sort of phenomena socially uh, in the Caribbean. Hmm. Um, this connection with, like you say, well, class and race, the darker, the more poor, and the associated with, with whiteness and richness. But um, I'm also going to jump to a question from Filippo, who, Felipe, excuse me, um, who asked the question while you were actually talking. He was very quick in the off the mark. He says, um, do you have any particular thoughts on using ethno-racial as an umbrella concept which may capture both racial and ethnic identities and experiences in Latin America and Mexico in particular? Do you think it might be useful or harmful in the anti-racist efforts in the region? Um, yeah, it's a term that's often used um, in, in various contexts. In Colombia, it's quite often used um, to refer to a, a particular conjuncture in that country and in Ecuador as well of, you know, that blackness is identified very strongly with a particular region of the country, uh, which has a kind of, I mean, what one might call perhaps an, an ethnic identity, because it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's got a, it's, it's about a particular region and a particular history and a particular set of cultural uh, attributes, music and food and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's something that looks like a kind of ethnic identity going on there, but it's also a black identity. So it's racialized. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of different problems around that because, you know, in Colombia anyway, a lot of the legislation that was introduced in, in, under multiculturalist reform Focus specifically on that region of the country, which was a region of interest to the government for you know, strategic geopolitical and economic reasons and so forth. And you know, the land rights were given to communities in that area and somehow the whole issue of blackness became focused on that particular region of the country. Whereas actually only a minority of black people in Colombia live in that region. Most of them live on the Caribbean region uh, and in you know, the cities of the interior and so forth. So there's a kind of danger around ethnicizing uh, a racialized condition in the sense that in Colombia anyways, that it focused, you know, it tended to exclude large numbers of um, especially urban black uh, population. So, you know, there, there are some dangers around that, um, which a, um, a, a stronger focus on racialized systems of inequality will, will bring forth. So, yeah, I think there are some risks attached to the ethno-racial um, focus. Should we go to the other questions? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, if Monica, you wanted to come in on that, but I can also go to yeah, the next yeah, question. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Um, I think Rosaline, I saw your hand up first, and I can also see the question in the chat from Charles. So Charles, note that I've seen your question, but I'll let Rosaline uh, go first. Sorry, Rosaline. You're fine either way. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Um, Hi, Rose. Good Hello. To see you. Um, thank you so much for this really fantastic presentation. It's so exciting to hear about your work. Um, I remember when you were starting out on it quite a long time ago now. So that's fantastic to see it all coming through. And um, well, so my question is to do, it's, I suppose it's coming from the position who's somebody who's worked mainly in indigenous parts of the Andes in Peru, Bolivia and Ecuador. And there too, I mean, I would very much agree with you that it's good to call out racism, to use the word, to call the spade a spade, if you like. But at the same time, I'm not quite sure how, what potential there is for it to really take off, because there does seem to be a strong association between the idea of racism and blackness. And it's actually come through quite a bit in even your own words. I don't know if you even realise, but just now Pete said, it's black, so it's racialized. And, and so I'm just wondering whether, you know, it, indigenousness, is that also racialized? And how do you see that kind of uh, intersection in your grammars? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Can I, I'll just say that when I, when I said it's 
what I was talking about was specifically that that particular conjuncture in Colombia where yeah. the, the the Pacific coastal region is, is a racialized identity. I wasn't yeah. talking about in general terms. Yeah. Monica, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. I just think that precisely we think that alternative grammars using the idea give space for all communities to um, address how structural racism affects their struggles or their situation. So the fact that indigenous peoples not, are not so, not, not fully, because we did find that people use it, particularly in cases in Ecuador, the Saraguro case, where people were, when confronted with direct violence, very clearly can elaborate on racism as a cause and a situation and describe it as racism. So, um, so I think I think what we what we're saying is that we don't, on a way, we don't need to get married to the word. What we need to understand is the, the potential. If you do, but if you don't, having the awareness and a strategic management of the situation as racism, together with the other claims that people might do, might have for life, for you know, struggle for land, for dignity, for um, safety for em environmental rights that you know it's part of it and I think it's part of this um, so I think it would strengthen strengthen the clarity of the situation because there is an awareness that many of these struggles are related to people's condition to people's identifications to people's ways of living to people's bodies so I think that that doesn't you know and I think displacing it to blackness and to black people is also like, you know, it's a way of, um, I mean, it could be a way of wishing it was just there, but actually it crosses all of society. I mean, that's the other claim I think that I, I've always been really interesting in putting forward that, you know, we are all somewhere in the circulation of racism. You know, there is, that we all occupy space, every, every, everybody. So indeed, indigenous peoples too. The question would be what, would advantages come to their struggles if they were able to strategically use an, an understanding of a structural racism and include it in their vision for a, a, their vision for the society that they want to pursue? I guess that's where I would. Mm. Thank you. That's a great answer. Thank you, Rosen. Pete, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, de I definitely see. Indio as a racial category. I mean, I know some people call it an ethnic category, but for me, because it's you know, rooted in, in that colonial history, uh, alongside uh, all the other categories that emerged at that time, which are racial categories, you know, for me, it, it, it is a racial category. And therefore, you know, people, discrimination against that, people who fall into that category or are labeled with that category is definitely racism. Um, and you know the, the structures, the, the structural inequalities that affect uh, indigenous peoples are also uh, racialized inequalities for sure. Um, so it's you know it's very important. It has it was very important for us in our project to include indigenous peoples, indigenous organisations uh, as part of that whole dynamic of looking at racism and anti-racism and so on. Um, I mean, there is, you know, there are some sort of interesting questions around that. So, for example, some North American, Canadian and North American um, US indigenous intellectuals explicitly argue that the whole agenda of anti-racism has been kind of colonized by, by black people in, uh, in, in the Americas and somehow isn't relevant to um, to Native American struggles. So Native American struggles are about land, they're about sovereignty, they're about autonomy, uh, political sovereignty and so on. Whereas, you know, in, in their argument, anti-racism is something else that doesn't, you know, that applies to black people, not to them. I see that as a kind of, um, as, a, as a, a counterproductive move myself, because, you know, to deny that those issues of autonomy and land and sovereignty and so on are somehow divorced from the structures of racism and so on seems to me um you know to be a little bit misguided thank you that's great thank you yeah um i'm really enjoying listening to you guys i must remember to, to actually moderate um another question in the chat and then i'll come to ariadna who has her hand up 
Um, can state violence be understood as part of the backlash that Nick with them mentioned, for example, through forced disappearances and extrajudicial killings perpetuated by the state in the Azotzinapa case, but also in relation to feminicides and other similar expressions of systemic racism in Mexico. And there's a second part to this question, which is, and to what extent state violence inhibits more overt or explicit movements against racism, given the very unequal structures that characterize Latin American societies? Thank you. And that question comes from someone called Charles. Um, yeah, I, I can start with that, I guess. Um, yeah, definitely, absolutely, definitely. State violence can definitely be understood as part of that backlash. But it's also, as Monica was just saying, you know, we found that when indigenous people, especially, and but also black people experience state violence, not only state violence, but violence directed at them, you know, because they're indigenous and because they're black, and then they kind of perceive that, that experience of trauma and violence and, and, and you know, physical trauma and psychological trauma, it pro provokes them very, very strongly to talk in terms of racism. They suddenly start talking uh, very overtly about racism, whereas perhaps they hadn't before. And, you know, there's some connection between body violence uh, and the perception that that violence has been directed at, you know, brown and black bodies and so on, that makes people want to talk in terms of, of racism. So it's part of the backlash, but it's also part of the, of what provokes people to, to be explicit about racism, I think. Um, yeah, that's what I think I just want to say that. Mm. Yeah, that's fine. You, you don't want anything, Monica. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Ariadna, your hand is up. Would you like to turn your mic on? Yes, thank you. Thanks very much uh, for a very interesting presentation. I much enjoyed it. Um, I well, I, I think is um, I, I totally agree that what one can see in um, movements such as Neo Zapatismo in Mexico and then other land and environmental movements in Latin America is a racially aware class consciousness from what I've read and seen in the literature. I'm not a specialist on the topic. Um, and I found that particularly useful to, to, to contrast with my experience, again, not as a specialist, but just as somebody looking at what's going on uh, in Mexico City, with this recent campaign of Poder Prieto, which has a very explicitly anti-racist campaign. And I, I've been wondering how much that permeates to, to, to different sectors or not. And I noticed this, this campaign was promoted by actors and actresses, and it was, it, it was relatively big in social media from what I could see. And uh, there was a, there was considerable involvement of what I would call um, perhaps middle-class indigenous intellectuals in Twitter, people like film director Luna Maran, who is the daughter of a, a renowned uh, uh, indigenous activist, linguist Yasnaya Aguilar, who's a Nietzsche intellectual. And when I was seeing what they were doing and then presentations on Mexico City television, I was struck by the fact of, you know, how very middle class all these people were, whether they were self-described mestizos or indigenous or, 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 or well, or mije, zapoteca, etc. And I, you know, I I do wonder what risks we run there. And I know this is, you know, this this particular campaign is not part of your research, but I wonder what you think about it and um, that. Yeah, and I certainly heard these courses that were extremely focused on race and, well, maybe class aware, but no so much. So like mm. the right opposite, like the mirror of what you found, I think. So just what do you think? Mm. Um, so I can start maybe. Um, I do think that in the Mexican situation is great something's happening for the mestizo population. It's like, okay, finally there's an organization that is so claiming or trying to bring some awareness about uh, what is it like to be dark skinned. And I think the conversation of skin color that has been developing in Mexico with the various 
you know, surveys and the service of social mobility crossing with the very infam infamous but very useful uh, color palette of Perla that has been, you know, creating all these possibilities for people to see, oh, now we have a more kind of explicit explanation to why I just never go up the ladder, I never uh, attain this or how this promise of mestizaje and of social mobility of meritocratic supposedly societies is not being fulfilled. So I think that's quite good. But I do notice that it's almost like, it's almost almost my, I see that reflected in my own experience researching racism where there was so much on class at the beginning, Every, all the explanations about difference and inequality were about class that I was like determined not to mention it, not to even engage with it. And I'm so thankful of Pete's insistence in bringing this one and also his observations of this and coming up with this concept because it actually is like, we cannot be doing that almost tantrum, you know? And maybe we, it's almost like a tantrum, isn't it? Like, I'm not gonna look at class because it's all about race. And, and now we can see that I wish that they could take that on of saying, we need to be considering this, this in, no, as intersectional subject. And the other thing that is very worrying for me about Poder Prieto and these, um, these mestizo organizations, although I, I'm, I, I'm saying this at the same time that I praise that they are existing, is that of their implicit anti-Black racism. There has been a lot of... Um, they had a campaign, for example, where they were saying our skin is flavorsome, is sabrosa, is amazing. We are full of flavor and all. And I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Stop, stop there. Like we were all doing fine with the, you know, Poder Prieto, but the moment that, so I think that's where like, you know, we need to keep um, being aware of how these systems of oppression almost rely on each other to continue. So like we make use of sexism to push forward an anti-racist agenda. We make use of anti-black racism to push, put forward anti-race and anti-indigenous claims or anti-mestiz, you know, or the mestizo. So I think there's, there's, there is, um, a need, that's why I think the, the alternative grammars of anti-racism as a concept is quite interesting because it, it's opening us to think, how do we think intersectionally in a way mm -hmm. so that we move things together? Because what we need is actually an anti-oppression stance or an anti-oppression mobilization that is able to consider all the different factors. But of course, it's, I know it is challenging and it's a demand, but I think that's at least where my mind's going. How do we think of oppression as this constant mobile thing that is pushing in different directions and where racism has a very clear place alongside, you know, at least sexism and classism and, and we know other structures, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I just realized, I hope I'm not missing anyone's hand. Um, because there's actually multiple screens, but it's okay. I don't think I did, I had a quick check. Um, I actually have a small question that I'm going to jump in with in the little interlude before anybody else asks another question. And it was around, um, it's kind of on a similar note actually. Um, you mentioned the Chao Racismo. Oh my God, sorry, my Spanish is atrocious. The Colombian group. Um, and I just kind of wondered if, speaking to this question of, um, and you mentioned them being kind of a middle-class organization. and. I wondered if you thought that they were mobilizing in some way um, against the, you, you mentioned earlier that class in, it's easier to kind of uh, cite the injustice of class discrimination. And I wondered if you felt that they'd somehow relatively cleverly been able to fore, foreground racism in their argument and their work because they were kind of playing on this idea of a class injustice that was sort of creating a sort of racism. If that, if, if, I hope that question is not as bundled as it sounds in my head. <laughs> Do you understand the question? It's kind of like, are they somehow utilize, utilizing this idea of class injustice and then sort of somehow projecting it into a race question and it somehow works? If that um, well, yeah, I mean, in principle, I think so, yeah. But I guess that, you know, the, the limitation for us with them was 
the fact the way they wanted to solve that problem um by creating a black middle class or at least folk, i mean there's nothing wrong with creating a black middle class don't get me wrong i mean it's, that's good that you know you want to do that but what it means is that none of your actions and policies are really directed at the vast majority of the black population who are you know not middle class um and don't have it are never going to become middle class or not you know in a kind of um definitive or consolidated way so um yeah i think that was the kind of problem i think you're right that they that they they were trying to get at uh, a combination of race and class issues. They, you know, they, they had this idea of, you know, black equals poor, that's the problem. So that's about the intersection of race and class. And they were, you know, all their programs about certification of businesses, you know, for inclusiveness and so on. But the kinds of businesses that they were certifying were, pe were businesses that in any, uh, you know, um, realm were only going to, going to be employing very small numbers of, of, of black people or even working class people to some extent. Um, so, you know, they, that was the, the issue was that their focus was, in, was you know, entire, predominantly on that kind of the beauty pageant, you know what I mean? That was, that was why we showed that picture of the beauty pageant was that although that only represented a small element of what they were actually doing, um, it was nevertheless the kind of symbolic center of, of what their agenda was, was about, I think. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to ask one more question and I check that there's nothing in the chat. Um, for me, your work really threw up a couple of UK similar specific examples. When you were talking about the Brazilian group, Mothers Against Guns jumped straight out at me. I was like, oh, wow, that's a really similar sort of organisation. Um, and when you were talking about the, um, the Afro-Ecuadorian group and the Brazilian group, and they, and they talk about place being kind of central to their organising, um, and sort of secondary to race compared to the chair of racism. I really brought to mind the ideas, some of the work of Michael Keith, who talks about sort of geographies and, and, and racialized geographies in the UK. Um, and I wondered if that also struck you and, and, and what possible meanings there might be found from that, if there are any. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can, yeah, that's an, an item of interest to me, the, the relationship between race and space and the geographies, racialized geographies and um, the racialized topographies and so on. I mean, in Colombia and in me, me, actually many Latin American countries, the relationship between race and space is actually very constitutive of um, of racial racialized structures of oppression in those countries. So, you know, the fact that in Colombia, for example, you have this Pacific coastal region, you know, which is even though it's not where most black people live, is a kind of symbolic center of blackness. You know, that's all about the way that race and disadvantage and space have been uh, historically woven together in, in particular ways that are you know, have really consolidated the the disadvantage for that re for that region and make it look like a purely kind of you know problem of development and a problem of peripherality and marginality and it's just by accident that it, you know it happens that there's mostly black people who live there you know, it's not an accident. That's a historical determination, which has been mediated by racism from the colonial period right through to the present day. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, if you, can, you can apply the same kind of analysis to segregation within cities and so on, as, you, as you're very well aware, I'm sure. So for me, yeah, that, that, that constitutive relationship between race, race and space is very important, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I would like to add to that, that, for example, is also, I mean, the, the, the issue of racialized geographies, it could be very erasing of um, diversity, multiplicity, conviviality. So for example, in the Costa Chica of Mexico, the, in the, it's a, a coastal region in, this, in the states, between the states of Guerrero and Oaxaca, somehow the discussions and the emergence of uh, black mobilization, black movement, that loosely called black movement, has um, somehow colonized that space as black. And now people are referring like, oh, if you think about blackness in Mexico, it's there, right? And actually doing research there, you find that there is something I like to call like a, you know, a coastal cosmopolitanism of some kind or where people, you know, there are white people, mestizo people, indigenous people, very greatly, people are called Afro-Indios, like 
that very clearly can see their roots in indigenous and black communities that have developed in the area. So it's much more diverse. So, but there's like these strategic uses of the space that suddenly sort of both on the one hand promote the visibilization of a group that has been quite in quite denied in Mexico, but at the same time does it to the expense of other groups. So I think it's interesting to think about space in that way. Um, Thank you. Um, I think we absolutely see similar things here where we think about black communities and um, I've often argued these black communities don't really exist. They're always multicultural spaces, um, but you might find a few black people there more than you'd find anywhere else. Exactly. Um, so it's really interesting that you have very similar phenomena. Um, I've got two questions for you and I suppose if we're slowing down we might wrap up after these. Um, so if you do have a question you may think of and waiting, please do jump in because I think we're coming towards the end. Uh, Taylor? And then Charles, I'll ask you a question in the chat. Oh, Taylor, you had your hand up. Did I, did you? Oh, it's a, <laughs> oh, no, it's a mistake, he says. <laughs> no problem at all. I'll ask the question in the chat then. Um, just thinking about what Dr. Moreno Fuguera, I'm really sorry. Um, I practiced your name, I promise, and it's just nerves. Um, brilliantly mentioned in relation to how mestizo anti-racist movements can reinforce anti-blackness and or sexism. My question is to what extent alternative grammars of racism might also silence other manifestations of racism by reproducing colonial binary frames, e.g. indigenous or black minoritarian groups versus mestizo or white majority groups. Can we think of Latin American society as being characterized by multiraciality, especially if we consider Chinese Jewish groups? Where do they figure in your analysis? Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't think that the term is silence or the manifestations, but actually gives the opportunity to bring more manifestations to the fore. In our case, we definitely made a point of focusing on indigenous and black struggles in Latin America and we were looking for them. And, and I, that doesn't mean that we don't consider that mestizaje as, you know, as this racial project of Latin America has, um, you know, like involved and deleted in that process or not deleted, but like suppressed the visibility of, the multiplicity of the homo, the the multiplicity of of people that live in the in the Americas. Of course, we think. Well, I agree that, for example, anti-Chinese racism, together with anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism, are are essential to understand mestizaje in Mexico and to see how it has uh, cemented a particular sense of. Mestizo culture and mestizo ness and mestizo national identities. Um, I also think that understanding not only Jewish Jewish people but all sorts of other communities that live in in Latin America is very important. And I actually think the alternative grammars as an idea tries to bring. I mean, it's not married to indigenous or black or anything. It's actually trying to think about different forms of oppression. So we might consider how religious identities fit into this, or we might think of any other sort of uh, connections, but definitely um, we are trying to think of, um, yeah, multiple possibilities. I don't see that necessarily happening. Hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. Um, I mean, you know, it just so happened we were, we were focusing on particular indigenous and black organizations here. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I said in relation to Marichui and the Congreso Nacional Indígena was that, you know, lots of different people might be able to identify and feel angry about those tweets about Marichui without, you know, even if they're not indigenous, they could be working class women who are brown skinned, you know, uh, Chinese, let's say, who also feel, um, you know, oppressed by the whole, all the structures of domestic service and the fact that um, those are the only kind of opportunities that are, are, are open to them. And then you get these middle class, you know, probably white people, you know, tweeting insulting comments about being a domestic servant. So, you know, there's the point about those uh, alternative grammars of anti-racism is that they allow, uh, you know, a wide variety of identifications with 
those kinds of causes, even though they're not um, be precisely because they're not always, they're not necessarily tagged to or linked to specific ide essentialized identities. I mean, I don't know that we could end on a better note. Um, that was uh, such a, such a, such a um, fantastic presentation. A, a really, a really interesting project. Um, I really appreciated the sentiment of justice at the heart of all of it. Um, you talked a lot about the imagination of what we want to see, the kind of change we want to see. And it was frankly quite inspiring. Um, so thank you very much for being with us this evening. Um, I don't know if you have any final comments, either of you or both of you. I would just say thank you to everyone for their, their part, yeah, for coming and for the very interesting questions and so on. And uh, thanks, Kiswa, for um, your your chairing and moderation. It was very good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It'd be lovely to see you all if you can turn your cameras for a second. And yeah, I was going to say, if everyone wouldn't mind, it'd be great to turn our cameras on, turn your mics on, give them a loud round of applause for being fantastically brilliant and sharing their expertise this evening. Oh, with me. nice. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all Thank for you. coming and staying and joining. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Peter and Monica. And um, the third, the next series will be online. Check the website. I'm going to get the rate date wrong, so I better not say. Um, please look <laughs> out for the fourth installment of our Race and Racism series here at the Institute of the Americas. Thank you very much for your time and for being with us and uh, your great questions. Um, my name is Dr. Kesper John. I'm at the Institute of Americas UCL. This has been fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Don't forget to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs>